Waterways exhibit, we have, of course, in our auditorium, the Smithsonian Waterways, which is presented to us through a grant from Indiana Humanities, as well as support from Museum on Main Street. And tonight we have Dr. Ken Beavis. He's a professor in the geology department at Hanover College. He is an expert in the field of water and hydrology, and he's going to tell us about our local area, all the things that we see in our everyday lives and maybe take for granted. And um, I think it, it's going to be a very, very interesting program. Our uh, next program will be February 1st. So we'll have Jan Beatrice presenting on the amazing Carter family crossing barriers. So tonight we have Kim Beavis. And all right. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is a good opportunity for all of us to, uh, to learn a little bit about uh, the water in our, our local uh, backyards. So we'll go ahead and, uh, and get started here. So of course, we all know that water is a vital resource. We, we need it. You can't live without it. No living thing on this planet can survive without adequate sources of water, either to consume or to live in, for that matter. Um, so I thought I'd start off with just a basic uh, diagram here of the water cycle, the hydrological cycle. And so obviously we are located along one of these. So we are part of this water cycle. We make use of the water cycle in our everyday lives. But uh, just, you know, give you a little bit of background here, of course. So most of the water on the planet is located in the oceans. And there is some water on land as well in the forms of lakes and streams. And perhaps not in this area, at least not recently, but there used to be glaciers. And uh, there are still some glaciers around in the higher uh, mountains and higher latitudes. So we have this water on the surface and that water is evaporated into the atmosphere. And when it gets into the atmosphere, it undergoes uh, condensation and turns into clouds and eventually rains back down onto the surface. If it rains into the ocean, well, a lot of it does because 70% of the earth is covered in oceans, but some of it will land on the land and then that water will eventually collect and coalesce and will form those lakes and streams and or uh, flow down, percolate down into the ground and form, form what we call groundwater. And so, so this is a cyclical process and as long as we don't tamper with it too much, uh, it operates pretty effectively and, and uh, provides uh, the water that we need as well as as every every other thing on earth so if we sort of focus down a little bit and uh, limit ourselves to the landscape uh, we can see that the the land's surface is formed of a series of uh, parcels of land in which all the water would collect and would run to an outlet somewhere. And we call these uh, landscape features watersheds. And so Jefferson County has its share of watersheds. Uh, this map here just is an example of, of what a, a, a classic watershed consists of. So of course we have the channelized flow of water that makes up the, the, the streams and, and rivers. But we also have um, water that's flowing beneath the surface that we can't see in the form of groundwater. But all of that water is collecting then, coalescing, and eventually making its way to a specific outlet and, uh, and then entering another body of water. In this case, the ocean, but it could be just simply a larger river or a lake or what have you. So we all live within a watershed. So watersheds come in a variety of, 
uh, shapes, sizes, etc. And, uh, and so this diagram here is just showing you a basic watershed and uh, all of the pieces and parts that make up that, that watershed. So here we have the channelized flow of water. That water is flowing at the surface and is flowing to some specific outlet. But where did that water come from? Well, that water comes primarily from two sources. It comes from runoff, which is water that's flowing across the surface of the ground and entering the channel. That typically only occurs during high precipitation events, intense rainfalls, and so forth. Much of the water that's entering the channel is actually coming from water that infiltrates into the ground and then flows down slope beneath the surface and then enters the channel that way. So it's sort of hidden water, but it turns out there's a lot more water down here than there is up here. So about 35 times as much groundwater um, in any watershed than there is surface water in that, in that watershed. There's other pieces and parts to this model as well. There's the floodplain that sits adjacent to the channel, and the floodplain can be occupied with water during certain times of the year when you have these large precipitation events and you exceed the capacity of the channel to store all that water, then it will flow out onto the landscape and, and, and onto the floodplain. There are valley side slopes here along the edges of the floodplain, and of course those are catching much of the water and, and allowing that water to move down slope and, uh, and make its way to the, to the stream. So this is where most of our runoff is, is occurring. We also have the drainage divide that sort of bounds the entire watershed. If you were to pour a bucket of water out onto the watershed divide, theoretically half of it would flow in one watershed and half of it would flow into an adjacent watershed. So when that water makes its way into the channel then eventually it's going to leave the system at the outlet. So you can think of the watershed divide as where the water enters the system, enters the, the watershed, and the outlet as, as where the water exits. But again, it's the water below the surface that's the most important. So this water is infiltrated into the surface and then makes its way down slope to the stream. The relationship between runoff and infiltration is inverse. What that means is that the more infiltration you get, the less runoff you get. So if infiltration is high, runoff will be low. Typically, that's the way we want it. We want water infiltrating. We don't want it runoff as runoff because runoff then contributes to other problems like soil erosion. Okay? So if we can get the water into the ground, we're in, we're in better shape. So then the stream itself consists of a gravity driven flow of water. Gravity is pulling it down slope and bringing it to that lowest position on the landscape, which, uh, which is the, the outlet again. Beneath the surface, we have this unsaturated zone, and that's separated from uh, the saturated zone by a water table. You can think of the water as moving downward like you would pour water into a cup. The water would then hit an impermeable layer at depth and would gradually work its way up through 
uh, towards the surface. So during a given rainstorm, what you typically see is that the water table rises as you're infiltrating more water into the ground. And there are times when the water table literally can rise all the way to the surface and, and create localized flooding along the, along the uh, uh, banks of the stream. So back to our typical watershed then. So this watershed then consists of a drainage network, a network of small streams entering bigger streams, entering still bigger streams, all of which are gradually merging and moving that water down the channel, down towards the outlet. And so you can envision a watershed as being relatively simple, like this one, or extremely complex, like the Ohio River watershed. So the Ohio uh, being 900 and some miles long and made up of many, many tributaries is obviously a much more complicated system than this, uh, this relatively simple watershed shown in the, in the picture. So, again, where's all the water coming from? It's coming from runoff off of the surface. Again, that is typically only going to occur during storms. It's coming from groundwater discharge, so the water that has infiltrated and made its way down slope to the stream channel. And it's coming from a little bit of precipitation directly onto the channel itself, but that's only a, a, a minor amount. Streams can lose water. So we're not necessarily going to just be gaining water at the same time we're losing some of that water. We can lose water in a variety of ways. We can lose it to evaporation. So you can have sunlight beating down on the channel, warming the water and, and evaporating some of that water away. But you can also have a process which we call groundwater recharge. That is not very typical in Indiana. It's much more typical of desert environments where you might have a mountainous area nearby. The mountainous area typically receives the water. The water moves down the channel. But once it enters the lowland, the dry areas, then it actually seeps back into the stream bed and disappears into the ground. So not common around this area, but it is a, a, a pretty common process in many other parts of the world. Well, so if we uh, take our watershed and slice it in half and then look at it on edge, we might see a longitudinal profile that looks something like this. From the uplands to the lowlands, from the uplands to the sea, or take this away and put the Ohio River in instead and consider all the tributaries that flow down and into the Ohio. So in the longitudinal profile, you have, um, again, water moving from the higher elevations to the lower elevations. But in this case, the water, once it reaches this position here, which we call the base level, there's a change that takes place. The water on the landscape above that dashed line is capable of eroding the landscape is is capable of modifying the landscape but once it reaches the base level then it switches over to a depositional system so the sediments that it eroded off the landscape end up being contributed to to that um, outlet area here which again could be the Ohio in our part of the world, but it could be ultimately the, the ocean in, in other places. Well, this base level becomes important because in our area, we would call that the local base level. And all the streams in southern Indiana flow to that base level. So the base level controls when you switch from erosional to depositional 
systems. So when, when you would switch over to um, a sedimentation of, of the stuff that you stripped off the, off the landscape. Base level becomes important if you look at the evolution of a stream system. So over long periods of time, base level can actually change. And again, in our part of the world, the base level has changed because the Ohio River Valley is itself cutting down into the landscape. And so as it continues to cut down, so too will the tributaries cut down. Okay. No stream can cut lower than sea level, though. So the ultimate base level on Earth would be, would be sea level. But of course, we know sea level isn't constant either. Sea level adjusts itself. So right now, sea level's actually rising globally because of climate change. Glaciers are melting. The water is warming, which causes it to expand. Those two reasons cause the water level to rise. So the, the base level is actually rising. Okay. At the mouth of the Mississippi, water level is rising. And so the base level goes up with it. But it wasn't always that way. 12,000 years ago, when large glaciers covered much of the planet, base level was actually 240 feet lower than it is right now. So this base level can, can adjust itself. So how are streams and groundwater systems related then? Well, they're connected. You can't have one without the other. Because the stream is literally the surface expression of the water table. So where the water table intersects with the Earth's surface, you get surface water. In this case, you get a stream, but you could also get lakes, ponds, things of that nature. So anywhere where the water table intersects the surface of the Earth, you're going to have standing water on the surface in the form of a stream in this, in this watershed model. So, groundwater too is a significant component of the hydrological cycle. And again, there's roughly 35 times as much of this stuff in the ground as there is this stuff in lakes and streams. So we often think of lakes and streams first because it's what we can see, it's what we can recognize. We can see the effects that we have on lakes and streams. It's oftentimes difficult to see what's going on under the ground, but there's a lot more under the ground than there is on the surface. So we need to pay attention to that water too. So how does that water get into the ground? So we have infiltration. I've used that word numerous times, but what does that exactly mean? So infiltration refers to the rate at which water moves into the ground. And that rate is going to be controlled by several factors. It's controlled by the porosity of the soil material. So porosity is the volume of open spaces. We call them pores. So the more pores you have, the more volume of pore space, the higher the porosity. Permeability refers to the interconnectedness of the pores. And permeability becomes very important because if you want to move water down through a soil, you want those pores, but you also want them interconnected. They have to be interconnected in order to get the water to move downward. Another factor that plays a role is what we call antecedent moisture. This is how much moisture is already in the soil prior to a given storm. So if you have two storms, one happening right after another, you might have a very high antecedent moisture level, in which case you can't get very much water into the ground. If you can't get water into the ground, 
as infiltration, what is it going to do? It's going to become runoff, right? So therein lies a problem because, again, runoff is what typically contributes to erosion of the land surface, and we don't necessarily want that. So that infiltrated water then is drawn downward into the ground and again, it's like filling a cup. It's going to draw down to some point where it encounters an impermeable material at the bottom of the cup and then the water is going to gradually fill upward from that level and that determines the position of the water table which is simply the surface or the, the, the interface between the saturated ground and the unsaturated ground. And so that water table can fluctuate. It can fluctuate seasonally between wet and dry seasons. During the wet season, of course, it's going to rise closer to the surface. During the dry season would be opposite. But it also can fluctuate during storms. Again, it can rise closer to the surface during, the, during storms. So the water table is going to be close to the surface during the wet season. And so if you have back-to-back -back storms, for example, that water table may literally rise all the way to the surface and, and create flooding conditions along the low-lying areas that are adjacent to the channel. So this is where we have all of our groundwater stored. And there are ways in which you can calculate how much water that is. There are ways you can calculate how fast it's moving towards the stream channel. And so you can get reasonably good estimates of how much water there is in the ground. And this is important for uh, determining um, the capacity of groundwater storage, how much water do you have to work with, uh, for example, if you wanted to use it for irrigation purposes or if you were going to put in a well on your property for, for your own personal uses. You might want to know how much water you actually have available for, for that use. So, of course, if the water is not infiltrating, again, it's running off the surface. So, let's switch gears a little bit, look at um, Look at our little part of the world here. So, of course, the watersheds of Jefferson County are part of a much larger watershed. So here is the Ohio River watershed. So you can see that it covers a pretty substantial area, and it includes some very large rivers unto themselves. So not simply the Ohio, but you have rivers like the Wabash and the Kentucky and so forth. And so... Um, encompasses a very large area and it's a very compli complicated system because of that. Here we are in Jefferson County. So in Jefferson County, if you look at the, at the bedrock underneath the, our feet, uh, you can see that it consists of layers of sedimentary rock that are tilted at a very slight angle off to the west. And that's because right over here, in Ohio, you have what's called the Cincinnati Arch. And so the rocks are, are arched up. And the arch basically runs north-south in this orientation. And so the rock layers on the western side of the arch tilt off to the west, and the rock layers over in Ohio tilt off to the east. Well, that sets up the landscape and the drainage pattern in our part of the world. Because if the rock layers are tilted towards the west, then most of the water actually flows off the landscape towards the west. It's literally flowing down the backs of each of those layers of, of rock. So we have little drainages along the Ohio here, very small streams, mainly because the rocks are tilted that way and the water wants to flow that way. And so it's flowing into the Muscatatuck, which then does eventually flow into the Ohio, but it's got a, a longer path to travel.
Okay, so the Ohio River in our part of the world is a little unusual. If you were to travel much further south towards Evansville, you would see a, a quite a different landscape. The uplands really don't exist there. It's more flat or gently undulating, and it spreads out quite far from the, from the actual river. But where we are, the river is quite confined. It's confined into a, a deep trench. And we call that an entrenched meander system. So it's an entrenched river system in our part of the world. So how did it get that way? Why is it entrenched here and not further down, down river? Well, we have to go back in time a little bit for that. The entrenchment of the Ohio in, in our part of the world was mainly due to the fact that there were very large glaciers covering most of Canada and the northern part of the United States, not too far in the distant past. This didn't happen just once. This happened upwards of a dozen times over the last uh, million years or so. And so you have a lot of weight stacked on the continent during those glacial times. And that causes the crust of the earth to actually subside with all that weight sitting on it. Well, if it subsides here, then it's got to readjust somewhere else. And so beyond the ice margin, it pushes upwards. So we had uplift in our part of the world because we were generally south of the ice. Well, where you have uplift and you also have a river running across it, it acts like a saw blade. The uplift literally lifts up into the river and the river cuts down into it. And so the entrenchment that you see here is primarily uh, because of that, that pattern of glaciation north of us and the uplift uh, to uh, in our part of the world. Of course, combine that with all the meltwater coming off the ice. So the Ohio River today has much less flow than it would have had during glacial times. And so it would have just been a much more powerful saw blade, if you will, to cut down into the, into the ground. So then ultimately, those two factors, the tilting of the bedrock and the entrenchment of the Ohio, is what produces the landscape and the watersheds that we have today. So if we take a look at um, Jefferson County, Indiana, we can see that it's basically divided up into three main areas. And so we have a relatively narrow strip of small watersheds bordering the Ohio. So these watersheds, of course, are, are feeding into the Ohio directly. And again, they're relatively small because the regional tilt of the, of the land and the rock units is off, off to the west. Okay? We also have some older terrain over here where the Indian Kentuck watershed is located. And that's in part because of the nature of the rock units. So the rock units over here are more erodible. And so it was easier for the stream systems to cut down into those rocks than in this area here, which is um, an area of relatively resistant rocks. And so that tends to form a major watershed divide between the eastern part of the county and the, and the western part of the county. And so then in the western part of the county, we have the Muscatatuck, which again is draining uh, more gently off of those um, very gently sloping rock units towards the, towards the west. 
And then down here in the corner, we have a little piece of, of uh, 14 Mile Creek uh, that does eventually drain down into the, um, into the Ohio, down by Charleston State Park. So if we take then a look at the, at the, a little closer look at the water resources of our county uh, itself, of course, um, we have the Ohio River. So the Ohio River, very significant to, to many of us. Uh, it's very significant recreationally. Uh, we have a beautiful waterfront uh, park down along the Ohio, but we also have navigation. We have barge traffic moving goods up and down the Ohio. And, um, and so for those reasons, it's very important. The Ohio River is also a local source of water for some communities. Some communities uh, obtain water directly from the river, which then of course has to be treated. And then we also use some of that water for irrigation purposes. Although we generally get plenty of rainfall in this ir area, and irrigation is probably relatively uh, minor. Groundwater is a big an important resource in, in this county. And that's because the county is relatively rural. And so we have a lot of individual homes having their own sources of water on their, on their land. And so these localized sources are tapping into the, um, the what we call an aquifer in the subsurface here that's located at relatively shallow depths beneath the surface. And so this diagram here just illustrates a, a typical well system that might be associated with a, an individual home. And so you put the well into the ground, you, you poke it down into the ground low enough so that it's within the aquifer, and then you can pump the water out and, and make use of it that way. Typically it creates what we call a a cone of depression or drawdown around the, around the perimeter of the well. But if you're living in this area, we get relatively ample rainfall. And so uh, that cone of depression during the wet season often goes back up and, and fills back in. It's only during the dry season that you would see any kind of, a, of, of an actual depression around the, around the well. Along the Ohio River, we also have very thick deposits of glacial sediments, outwash material that was brought in uh, during past glaciations. And those sediments also serve as an important groundwater source. So, um, in, in fact, the, the city of Madison gets most of its water from, from groundwater uh, beneath the, the level of the river. Well, there's another important recreational aspect to the water that we have in this county. Um, because we have those short, steep streams that flow directly into the Ohio, we have a lot of waterfalls in our part of the world. And so we know how important they are to the, to the local economy. Uh, our state park um, uh, preserves some pretty spectacular examples of waterfalls. So how do those waterfalls get there? Well, in our part of the world, again, we have these layers of rock that tilt gently off to the west. And so they're basically tilting a little bit away from the Ohio. So when the stream systems cut down through those layers, once in a while they encounter a resistant layer. And where that resistant layer occurs, the water can't cut down easily. And so what it's going to do is it's going to cut the underlying weaker layer, which was exposed by entrenchment of the Ohio River. Okay? So think back a half a million years ago, those little streams like Clifty Creek didn't exist. Water 
rain down on the landscape, gradually started to create a watershed. And as the water was cutting downward, it encountered this resistant layer. In our part of the world, that resistant layer is typically made of the Saluda formation, which is a, a, a resistant dolostone. But right along the Ohio, where it had entrenched down through multiple layers, there were weaker rock layers exposed at the base. And so it started to chew into those weaker rock layers, and it worked backwards and upstream. And so right now, where Clifty Falls occurs, that's all been cut back in roughly the last half million years. So if you go back in time, half a million years ago, there wouldn't even have been a river there or a waterfall there. So of course we have lots of waterfalls. We have Hoffman Falls, Tunnel Falls, Little Clifty, Big Clifty, Horseshoe, Deadman Falls, Crow Falls, Chain Mill Falls, Fremont Falls. And if you look at a topographic map, you can see where all of those waterfalls occur, and they all occur at almost the same level, the same elevation. And that's because of this resistant rock unit right here. So this is the Saluda, and because of its resistance, the water can't cut down through it very well, and so it creates a large hanging waterfall. And of course there are a few smaller ones higher up where you have the laurel formation, which is also a resistant unit. But overall, the big waterfalls generally occur at this position. So here's a couple of them. So this is Horseshoe Falls on the uh, campus of Hanover College. Um, you can easily get access to this. Um, Lots of people come in and, and hike the trail down to Horseshoe Falls. Um, this happened to be uh, last winter, I think. Um, so anyway, yeah, it was frozen over. It was pretty spectacular. This is Chain Mill Falls. Um, Chain Mill has a, has a unique history, which I honestly don't quite understand. But that right there is an artificial hole that they drilled down through the rock, and then they had some kind of a, a bucket system or something like that that was on a chain that they were using to, um, to mill grains. So they were using the energy of the flowing water to, uh, for their mill. And uh, I don't know quite, someone would have to explain to me exactly how that worked. But I've been there, I've seen the hole. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. And right up above the hole is the foundation of the old granary. Okay, moving on. Well, okay, so we have all these benefits to water, but we also have something else we need to concern ourselves with, and that's flooding. So living near water can, can also bring on some problems. So just briefly, the Indiana Floodplain Information Portal is available to the public. It's easy to find. Just literally Google that. And you can look up your own community. You can look up the flood hazard zones in your own community. So I did that for Lower Madison here. This is Crooked Creek right here. And of course, this is the Ohio. The bright colored patterns are indicating various levels of hazard. And so generally the, the stripy pattern is uh, off limits. You can't build anything there. Um, the only thing it could be used for is temporary recreational purposes and so forth. Uh, the blue zone is a little less dangerous, but is still considered high risk. And then you have the pink zones and, and so forth. And so you can you can go to this portal and you can look up specific information about a piece of property, for example, and you can find out what floodplain it sits on and, and what the risk is associated with flooding. And so it's, a, it's kind of a neat, uh, a neat little tool.
So I, uh, I looked up a, a specific spot here on the map, and I'm trying to remember where, where it was now. Um, I think it was down here near Walnut Street. And, uh, and so I was looking up what, what the risk was there, and it was in risk category A, which is um, considered high risk and uh, subject to uh, building restrictions because of the uh, potential for flooding. Um, you could still build there, but of course you would be looking at um, steep flood insurance uh, in order to be able to build in that location. But again, here's the, uh, here's the basic um, legend for the map and the various flood zones that are, that are on that map. So there's all this information out there and it's readily available, but where did it come from? Well, so we need to understand a little bit about the flooding process in order to be able to understand what that map is really telling us. And so if we look at any, any river system, a flood is basically happening because the water that's entering the stream channel has exceeded the capacity of the stream to hold it. Water's got to go somewhere, so it spreads out onto the adjacent land, which is what we refer to as the, the flood plain. So this photograph here is showing you a river at flood stage. So what that means is, is that if you put any more water into it, it's going to start flooding out onto the, onto the adjacent flood plain. It is at capacity. It is as high as it can go without flooding out onto the adjacent floodplain. This, of course, is from Lower Madison uh, back in 2018, and clearly we have exceeded the flood stage and it is flooded out onto, onto the adjacent um, floodplain. So why do floods occur? Well, they occur in response to that excess runoff. And they're going to either occur uh, after or during an intense rainfall or from snow melt or perhaps from a combination of the two. And that can produce what we call a runoff dominant stream system and a flashy response, which we call a flash flood. On the other hand, you can also have water that's contributed from the groundwater system, in which case the stream can still flood, but it has a much more sluggish response to it. So it can still flood, but it takes a more gradual approach. So our stream system here is on the receiving end of runoff and groundwater flow, and both of those factors can cause an exceedance of the capacity of the stream to store that water. So flood discharge can be modeled by a nice little graph here. So we've got a graph looking at time versus two parameters, runoff, or sorry, rainfall, and also the discharge in the channel. So this blue line represents the actual water in the channel. So we have a precipitation event. So this is measuring the amount of rainfall. The peak rainfall occurs here. This line is representing what the stream does in response to that precipitation. And so you can see that the peak rainfall occurs here. The peak discharge in the stream occurs here. And there is a certain amount of time between the two, which we call the lag time. How much time does it take for the stream to reach its highest um, flood, flood stage? This time is going to be determined by the nature of the watershed. Some watersheds are different than others, and so they respond in, in different ways. And so this lag time may be larger or smaller. Again, if it's a more flashy runoff dominated system, the lag time is going to be shorter. Okay. 
On the other hand, if it's a sluggish stream that's responding mostly to groundwater input, then the lag time is going to be longer. Okay? On the other hand, the peak is an also an important consideration. So the peak will be lower on a flashy stream. Flashy streams are just smaller, so they don't have as much water. On the other hand, very large stream systems like the Ohio tend to be more sluggish and tend to be more in response to groundwater, but they can produce very big floods. So flashy, faster, but lower peaks. Sluggish, slower, but higher peaks. Okay. So we have these flashy versus, versus sluggish streams and, and the response is based on the conditions in the, in the watershed. So here's a couple of, of possible conditions. So the size of the drainage basin matters. So small drainage basins tend to have a flashier response. But notice again, they're faster, but they're smaller peaks. Large basins would have a slower response, but they'd have a higher peak. Vegetation. If your watershed is mostly barren of vegetation, perhaps mostly farmland or maybe uh, highly urbanized, then once again, you're going to get a higher, shorter, uh, a shorter time lag, but a, a, a high peak. If it's covered in forest, then you're, you're doing well because the forest absorbs a lot of the water and can slow down the response and actually slow down the, or, or reduce the size of the peak. Steepness of the valleys. If you have really steep side slopes, the water can get there much quicker. So your runoff response is faster. And so again, you have a higher kind of a peak. And then if you have more gentle watersheds, you're going to have a, it's going to be slower response and more gradual. And then finally, um, soils matter too. If you have relatively thick, uh, permeable soils, well-developed soils, then they can absorb a lot of water and that's going to create a more sluggish response. On the other hand, if, if your soils are very thin, if you've got lots of bedrock exposed at the surface, then you're going to get a much more flashy kind of, kind of response. So how does urbanization play a role? Well, urbanization basically creates this kind of condition or that kind of condition. So when you urbanize a watershed and you create a lot of impermeable surfaces like parking lots and roadways, then you're going to push that water out of the watershed a lot faster because it can't get into the ground. It can't infiltrate. So again, go back to that infiltration versus runoff. The higher the the higher the infiltration, the lower the runoff. So here is a, um, a typical base flow or groundwater dominated system. So this is the Ohio River. So again, we're going to get that water in there. There's going to be a lot of it, but it's going to be a more gradual rise to a peak which is going to be typically relatively high and fairly long lasting going to be spread out. And so you might have the flood remaining on the floodplain for multiple days in a row. Okay? So that's pretty typical of the Ohio. On the other hand, the small tributary streams are more flashy in nature. And that's because they have steep side slopes. They're relatively small. They have thin soils, bedrock exposed closer to the surface. And so when, when they respond to a precipitation event, they're very, very dramatic. So very short-lived flood, but typically 
the water level rises very rapidly. This is Happy Valley Creek on the uh, campus of Hanover College. And here it is under normal flow conditions, barely any water in the channel. And here was after a, an all day rainstorm. You, the water level was so high that you couldn't cross the creek and there were literally um, chunks of rock as big as my hand bounding down the channel. You wouldn't have wanted to cross the stream. You probably would have hurt yourself if you could even stand up. So, last thing that I want to touch on is the impacts of human activity on watersheds. And just a, a little bit of a cautionary tale on how we, how we manage our watersheds and why we should um, manage them um, for the long term uh, so that we can uh, keep them in, in good shape. So, of course, um, one thing that we do is we, ext we extract water from our watershed. So we pump water out of the ground, we take water from the surface, we use that water for a variety of purposes, perhaps for irrigation or for direct um, use. Turns out the number one source of water use in the United States is watering our lawns. So that's the biggest use of water in the United States. So um, in our part of the world, again, perhaps not a big problem because we generally get ample rain, except for perhaps during September, that general part of the year. Dams and diversions. So the Ohio River is a classic example of that. How many of you know that the Ohio River is really just a long lake? <laughs> it really isn't a river at all. It looks nothing like it did 200 years ago. It was much more seasonal 200 years ago. So during the fall, people could actually walk across the river oftentimes. Now it's basically just a series of very long lakes because there are locks and dams, 27 of them, I think, along the, the Ohio River system. Well, that's great for navigation, but it's not necessarily great for um, critters living in the stream system that have a hard time moving up and down uh, past all those locks and dams. Deforestation, of course, uh, is, a, is an issue. In our part of the world, um, we're not deforesting the land for perhaps for the purposes of, of uh, putting in palm oil plantations, but we are deforesting uh, for cropland in many cases. We also deforest for urbanization is uh, urban sprawl in our major cities. Fallow farmland is an issue. The longer you leave the, the, the farmland without a cover crop on it, the more likely you will get runoff and runoff erosion. There are various point sources of pollution and non-point sources of pollution that enter our stream systems. So we have industrial and municipal sources, but we also have um, agrochemical sources and so forth that, that can enter our streams. So in Jefferson County, of course, much of the land is farmed. Again, it's, it's more rural than it is urban. And so soil erosion, fertilizer use, and fertilizer runoff, pesticide use and runoff, um, those are probably the more significant sources of water pollution. Um, although we do have uh, some urban areas like, like Madison, which would be contributing um, stormwater runoff from the streets and parking lots and so forth. So here's a couple of little diagrams illustrating what is a point source. So a point source is a singular source. It's the discharge from a factory, for example. And the point source then can be traced. We know where the pollution is coming from. We can trace it to its source and therefore we can monitor it and we can regulate it. We can pass laws that say, okay, factory X can only discharge uh, so many uh, of this kind of pollutant into the, into the river. And so Point sources of pollution 
are pretty well under control in, in this country. We have some pretty good laws in place that limit the amount of, of pollutants that you can put into a stream from a factory or, or a wastewater treatment facility, for example. Non-point sources are a little more complicated because non-point source pollutants are spread over a broad area and then they drain off of a broad area into a stream. So you can't really monitor and regulate them because there's no source to trace back to. It's coming from a large area. It's coming from pesticides spread on cropland or fertilizers on cropland. It's coming from urban water runoff off of the streets and parking lots. And so how do you, how do you trace that to a source? And if you can't trace it to a source, then you can't really regulate it because there's no way to monitor who's doing what on the land. A good example of stormwater runoff at this time of the year is road salt. Every time that we think it's going to snow, we put an inch of, of salt on our roads to keep the snow melting. But all of that road salt ends up as runoff into our lakes and streams. The one thing that I want to focus on in terms of non-point sources is soil erosion. Because we, ha we live in a county that is, um, uh, is fairly heavily farmed, um, it stands to reason that we're going to have a, a lot of soil erosion. If you've ever looked at the Ohio, you know what I mean. <laughs> it's brown for a reason. So how does that soil erosion work? Well, it's sort of a three-step process. Rain falls down on the ground. That rain is beating down on the ground, and as it does so, it dislodges particles of soil and sort of plugs up all of the surface pores, and it creates a, a dense crust on the surface of the ground. Of course, the more open it is, so open fallow farmland, for example, the more that that surface crust can build up can build up much faster, much easier um, on open terrain. Once you have plugged up the surfaces, the water can't get into the ground. It can't infiltrate. And so it's going to begin to run off of the surface, and it runs off in a form of water that we call sheet wash. So it's running off as a thin layer, a thin film, if you will, off the surface. Best example I can give you of that is if you've ever been to the Walmart store during a rainstorm and you watch the water running off the parking lot, you can see these little wavelets moving across the parking lot. That's sheet wash. Okay. So that's going to be happening on, on this soil crust that we built up early in the storm. That water is going to gradually concentrate into natural depressions on the slope. And so it collects into these natural depressions, and as it does so, it gets thicker. And at some point, the thickness of the water is enough that it carries enough energy that it begins to pluck soil particles up off of the surface of the little streamlet, and you get erosion. That's when we create rills. So now we've concentrated our water into these natural depressions, but the water concentration has enough energy to begin to erode down into the surface. At some point, it erodes down into the surface deeply enough that it actually erodes through the crust that was formed early in the storm. Once it erodes through that crust, it can actually erode into the subsurface faster than the crust. And it creates like a little miniature waterfall. And then it begins to erode backwards up the slope, up higher, higher up the slope. And that creates what's called a gully. 
So we go from raindrop splash and sheet wash to rills to gullies in the downslope direction as we pick up speed and we pick up um, depth of water. So of course, how do we, how do we deal with that? Well, vegetative cover is the best way to control soil erosion. If you have vegetative cover, then that prevents raindrops from splashing and, and being able to dislodge soil particles. If you have vegetated cover, it prevents the water from being able to concentrate so that it doesn't form rills. If you have vegetative cover, you've also got roots, you've got organic matter present in the soil. And those roots and organic matter bind the soil together and make it much stronger than individual particles would be. And so that can prevent soil erosion. So, so there's a number of ways we can do this, but it's all tied to, it's all tied to having healthy vegetation and, and, and cover crops and also um, healthy soils. So this is what we get if we don't do those things. So on the left here is surface runoff off of this parking lot being deliberately channeled into this little swale that they've built into the, into the curb. And the water just naturally runs off of that. And obviously it's going to erode the soil faster than this. So what it's done here is it's undercut the level of the pavement and actually created a pothole behind it there. So now the water, of course, just pours down through that and this thing is left high and dry. In this situation here, of course, this is classic gully erosion on, on farmland here. So again, the field has been left fallow for much of the winter in this case and water is naturally running off into this into this natural depression here and when it concentrates it then has enough erosive force to cut down into the into the soil and the the gully grows and expands in the in the headward direction so it's expanding up slope uh, in that direction so here's a little rill coming into a gully this is probably about the position of that crust and so once it's cut down through the crust, it can cut this stuff away faster than that stuff. And so it, it acts like a little miniature waterfall. Aha! What everybody's been waiting for. <laughs> the conclusions. Okay. So water resources in this county are diverse. We have a lot of wonderful benefits that we receive from, from our water resources and we have some, some issues. We have flooding, we have soil erosion and, and issues of that nature we need to deal with. Um, the flow of the water is, is basically controlled by the bedrock geology and also by the base level of the Ohio River. And so much of our water is, is flowing gradually off to the, to the east uh, there's only a smaller portion of the of the water that actually flows directly into the into the Ohio itself uh, until you get further downriver where the Muscatatuck joins the White and the White joins the Wabash and the Wabash joins the Ohio. Um, our county's water resources are plentiful, so we generally are um, are pretty good in in terms of the amount of water we have much better off than, than many people. Um, we have water for navigation, we have water for recreation, we have uh, water, ample water for our municipalities. Um, and again, we need to worry a little bit about flooding and managing our flooding issues, but, um, but generally speaking, the water is, is more of a benefit than it is a, a hindrance. Um, the surface water is susceptible to pollution, however, and so we need to be considering um, our, our 
sources of pollution and, uh, and perhaps working better at, uh, at monitoring our, what we put on our farmland um, and, uh, and what's going on our roadways and so forth. Um, and then also monitoring our, our soil erosion problems and so forth. Um, one issue that I, I didn't really talk about much is septic systems. Um, again, during when, when much of the county is rural and individual homes have septic systems, one of the issues that comes up is the aging nature of many of our septic systems in this county. And when septic systems get old, they don't work right. And that can actually lead to pollution as well. That would be, I don't know, a point source, I suppose, because we could tie it to an individual, um, an individual home in many cases. But that uh, source of pollution is problematic because it pollutes the surface water adjacent to the home, which then also probably has a local well. So you end up polluting your own water. So, um, so this, is, this is important because, um, again, a lot of septic systems in this county are aging and um, there's really not a lot of financial resources available to help people um, put in new septic systems and upgrade their septic systems um, so that they're not mixing their um, sewer water with their drinking water. Anyway, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Yeah, we can take some questions. I talked to everybody to death. <laughs> question. One of the things in the waterways exhibit, and this is a plug, if you haven't been there yet, please come back and see the waterways exhibit. Uh, but there was, there's a map of the U.S. and it talks about in the future of the states that are going to have trouble with their water. Now, Indiana was not one of them. Uh -huh. I was wondering if you could address that. Well, um, certainly, much of the western U.S. is already on the verge, if not already, <laughs> having issues with water. Um, so if you look at the Colorado River system, for example, all of the water in the Colorado River, and then some, is already allocated. There is no water in the Colorado River. And there's been a 25-year drought in the western U.S and the amount of water in the Colorado River is decreasing at the same time that everybody wants to relocate to the western U.S. So you see all these towns growing up everywhere in the west at the same time that there's less and less water available for them to use. And western water law is really interesting because the way it works is First in gets the water. So if you were a farmer and you located yourself in along the Ohio or along the uh, Colorado River in the 1870s, you own that water. That's your water. You can do with it whatever you want. So if some town establishes itself upstream of you, and starts tapping into that water, you can sue them. And you can say, look, that's my water. I have water rights, because I was first in. So what happens then is, is states like California, <laughs> interestingly enough, they, they own 40% of the Colorado River, because they were first in. California was a state long before Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Wyoming, Utah, right? So, so California owns a big chunk of the Colorado River, even though they barely even touch its border. There's just like a little short little strip of, of California that borders the lower Colorado, and the lower Colorado doesn't contribute any of the water to the Colorado. It's all coming from 
well, almost all of it comes from comes from Colorado and Wyoming. And yet those mountain towns where everybody wants to go live these days in Colorado and Wyoming, they don't own the water. It's not their water. So when push comes to shove, what's gonna happen to those communities in 50 years when this drought continues as it seems like it's going to? California has the right to the water according to the laws and the laws of the land. So I don't know, it's, it's gonna be interesting. Indiana, perhaps not such a, such a problem. Although if you look at climate change models for Indiana, they're not good either. Um, by the end of this century, Madison, Indiana should be looking at 30 days out of the year minimum of over 100 degrees. Oh, yay. So it's going to get dry here too. Just not quite as fast perhaps. Not, but I mean, we have a lot of forest in this part of the world too. I, uh, one, one thing that I, I'm worried about is forest fires. You know, so far we've had ample rainfall that it keeps our forests relatively moist, but we also have a much larger population here and urbanization has spread out into the forests around our communities. And so I worry that what happens when you get big forest fires back here, because we know what they're doing out west and it's not good. So I think we're, I think we're seeing, what we're seeing out west is what we might be experiencing in, in our own communities in 50 years. So, yeah. Different subject. <laughs> you didn't talk much about aquifers and like underground, like what are those? Okay, so the so I talked about groundwater. Yeah. So an aquifer is is a groundwater system. So it's where water is stored in the subsurface and you have you have basically two kinds of aquifers. You have what are called unconfined aquifers and they have an impermeable layer on the bottom but they're exposed to the surface at the top. So my diagram of the watershed basically was showing unconfined aquifers. So they're, they're pretty typical and, and common, sort of ubiquitous around, around the world. Um, but they're also um, the ones that are most easily uh, overused and abused because of course they don't have a cap on them. So they're more readily polluted and they're more easy to obtain the water from them, so it's easier to dry them up, overuse their water. The other type of aquifer is what's called a confined aquifer, which is sandwiched in between impermeable layers. And confined aquifers are, are interesting because typically the, where the water enters that aquifer is oftentimes very far removed from where the water is actually being used. And so you can overuse those aquifers as well because if you, if you tap into those aquifers and draw out water from those aquifers and the distance, the flow distance from the source to where you're using it is very far, it may take decades for the water to get there. It may take centuries. So. There are confined aquifers that are called relic aquifers. So for example, under, under the Saharan Desert in Northern Africa, there are huge relic aquifers that were formed during the ice ages. And countries in Northern Africa are tapping into those aquifers now. Well, they're, they're literally mining them because when they remove that water, it's never coming back, at least not in any sense of time that we would understand or appreciate. So, yeah, so they, they both have their concerns, um, but those are basically the two kinds of aquifers that... And if they tap that type of aquifer, 
uh, and use the water, what's going to replenish that? Nothing. Nothing in, a, in any kind of time frame we would understand. So we'll have to call upon another ice age to, to replenish those aquifers. <laughs> and we're doing our best to prevent another ice age these days. So. <laughs> Yes. Um, who owns the Ohio River and who allocates the water? Well, the Ohio isn't, we don't have western water law in, in our part of the world. Um, so the Ohio is not owned by anyone. And because there's so much of it, right now it hasn't, it hasn't been an issue. I mean, there's enough water that it's it's not a problem. So, it only becomes a problem when when you over allocate a resource like the Colorado. Interestingly enough, when the Colorado River Compact was signed back in 1922, they overestimated the water. Then, <laughs> much less today. <laughs> so. Yeah, because they based the, the Colorado River Compact was based on a time period in which there was an overabundance of rainfall and the, the Colorado was gushing with water. And that's when they decided, okay, California, you get this much, Arizona, you get this much, Nevada, you get this much, etc. Well, then the Colorado River started drying up. <laughs> so now, the, yeah. So in our, our part of the world, it's not an issue yet, but it probably will be someday. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming.